Cartridges, cartridges, cartridges. We hunters and shooters can argue cartridges until we're green in the face. And I get accused of being an old FUD who likes old cartridges and guilty as charged. I do try to keep up with the new stuff and appreciate some of its attributes, but I found a younger man who really appreciates some of the new cartridges. You may remember him from an earlier podcast. This is Joseph Von Benedict. Oh, thank you for that rousing introduction. <laughs> you don't deserve rousing. You're going to torture me with your silly new cartridges today, aren't you? Well, I'm going to do my best. And I'll <laughs> tell you, I I do love the cutting edge new cartridges. And it's, you know, I've made a, a life study of ballistics and cartridges and, and watched with great interest those that are introduced and those that fall by the wayside. Ah. And those that succeed. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm not a vintage cartridge lover, too. I think we've talked in the past about the 300 h and h is one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, And I write the ball. vintage gun column for Shooting Times magazine. And I thought that so they made you do that. You actually enjoy it. Huh? That is one of my favorite assignments every month. Well, let's remind everyone to check that out. What magazine was that again? <laughs> oh, Shooting Times Shooting magazine. Times magazine. Yeah. If you want to read some of this guy's dribble, that's where you'll find it. Yeah, that's right. We just well, try and look at discontinued guns and have fun with them. So. You might as well use a discontinued writer to write about discontinued guns. <laughs> now, Joseph, let's talk about <clears throat> some of your modern cartridges. I like several of them. Mm -hmm. And if I were a younger guy just starting out, I would probably do... Uh, pick those over some of the older ones. But, you know, when I really look at the hard numbers on them, they don't do all that much more than hasn't been done before. But there are certain attributes in common with all of them, and I'm sure we're going to get into that today. So, folks, be ready to learn about why the new cartridges are potentially better than the old. And maybe I can pull in an argument from my side of the aisle talking about why I think the old cartridges can pretty much do what needs to be done. So let's start off with, I guess, a classic middle of the road, all around cartridge that most folks can relate to in one way or another to set the table. Sure. And we're going to set the bar with the 30 out six. Okay. Now, if you're a 308 guy, no problem. You're only about 100 feet per second behind it. And depending on whose factory loads you buy, you might be right there with it or even a little faster. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. So that is considered to be a do it all cartridge. Aside from obviously dangerous game stuff, and they can work there, but they don't let you. So we will use that as a benchmark to establish what we're talking about. A cartridge for hunting North American game, and if you go to Africa, going to work there as well. Sure. Yeah. And then you've got all the variations from it, the down to the 270s and the 65s and the 243s mm -hmm. and up to the 335s. The You name it, it's been done. Now we've got new cartridges that do pretty much the same thing. They're just shaped differently. Why are you excited about new cartridges and which ones are you picking as sort of the new standards that are going to set the, the table the way the 30 out six did back in 1906 and the 270 in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s? What's the new hot stuff? And let's start by, I don't know, should we start by caliber? Or do you want to go mm. by hunting species? How about some characteristics of the cartridges themselves that make them stand out? Okay. Let's so that right. <coughs> excuse me. For instance, we have one characteristic that pretty much spans the spectrum of all of the new modern cartridges, and that's rifling twist rate. Almost all the new stuff is twisted faster than classic cartridges. Now, why do we need that? Is because shooters are shooting farther than hunters ever have in the past traditionally. Right mm -hmm. now, we had a lot of competitive shooters that shot a thousand yards and passed clear back. I mean, as far as you can Black remember. Black powder era. Yeah. The Creedmoor match. Yep. You know, most people don't know the name. The 6.5 <laughs> Creedmoor came from the farm. A shooting range that I think is Long now Island. inside of New York yeah, State. Yeah, uh, New York City. Yeah. It's, it's not in New York City, but it's on Long Island that goes off to the east. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'm saying it's a highly developed region. Now. Yeah. Yeah. That right. used to be a place where world championship long range shooting matches were held. <laughs> It's called Creedmoor. So we have the 6.5 Creedmoor. Yes. Yeah. So because shooters are reaching out further, whether they're competitive shooters in the PRS competitive circuit or mm -hmm. 
hunters that want increased lethality at greater distances. They want to shoot higher uh, bullets with higher aerodynamics, better ballistic coefficients, long, sleek bullets that are built like, you know, a speedboat rather than Mack truck, a barge. <laughs> yeah, yes. barge. There you go. So to shoot a bullet, well, let's back up a little bit. What achieves great aerodynamics in a bullet? Your ballistic coefficient or your drag coefficient, if you're into Doppler and so forth. It's a combination of things. A long, sleek profile, mm-hmm. weight, right? I can a shoot certain it. amount of weight contributes. Well, you can't shoot a really long, slender, heavy bullet without spinning it real fast. Yeah, it won't stabilize. Yeah, it's like a top that isn't spun quite fast enough. It whoop, 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 and it falls over. Bullets that are not spun fast enough by the rifling will right. actually end up tumbling. And this is uh, one of the misnomers or mistakes that people have about bullets is that it's weight. You're shooting a heavier bullet, you need faster twist. Not necessarily. It's not the weight of the bullet, it's the length. Yes. Obviously, if you use a standard lead bullet, lead core bullet with a jacket, and you increase the weight, you're going to increase the length. So that's why most of us just think, well, it's a heavier bullet and you need a faster twist. Sure. It's a longer bullet. It's longer. And a good example would be Barnes's 168 grain LRX bullet in a 7 mm diameter. Mm -hmm. It's harder to stabilize, even though it's lighter than a flat base, lead tipped 175 grain nozzle partition. Sure. Right? Yep. They're both the same diameter, 7 mm, but the heavier one's shorter. So it's easier to stabilize. It's a more traditional shape. So modern cartridges have faster twist rates that shoot higher BC bullets, which mm-hmm. modern shooters want. Why do they want them? You get better accuracy? No. You get better wind bucking capability, which is very important if you're trying to shot, whether at a target or a game animal, out past what is considered the ethical norm, for game animals anyway. Plus, you get much greater retained velocity, which translates into bullet performance on impact. And that's a big deal. I've said for a long time on my podcast, the Backcountry Hunting Podcast, that any aspiring backcountry hunter should work hard to achieve what I call quarter mile capability. Just has a nice ring to it. Now, quarter mile is technically 440 yards, right? Yep. Now, that is kind of significant to me because... My stepdad was a jockey. He's passed away now, but we had a lot of fun attending races, horse races, and a quarter mile was a very significant distance in mm-hmm. a quarter horse race, right? Yep. And so quarter mile capability is just that sweet spot for me. I, I think every serious backcountry hunter should be a quarter mile shooter at worst. Now, sh- I, I'm going to stick my neck out here a little bit, but I really believe that a shooter that could achieve 400 yard ethical lethality 30 years ago before good laser range finders, dial up scopes and cartridges optimized for long range shooting should now be able to achieve that same level of lethality at 600 yards. I knew you were going there. Okay. Yeah. And with your traditional bullet in a traditional cartridge, that's much, much harder because you don't have the wind bucking ability. Mm-hmm. You don't have the retained energy on impact. Now, does that mean you can't take a traditional cartridge like a 300 wind mag, put a custom fast twist barrel on it, load it with long, heavy, high BC bullets and achieve that? Of course it doesn't. But there are cartridges that are built from the ground up. The entire concept is centered on achieving greater downrange capability. And that's what these modern rounds give us. Yeah. Now, the one argument that I would make against the long range stuff, before we stop talking about it, but we're going to get sure. plenty of debate from folks about the absolutely, ethical, and whatever. we should. Mm-hmm. But what you what you said about lethal <clears throat> performance in the shooter, if you were able to take a four hundred yard shot reliably because you knew you could back in the days when you were shooting one hundred thirty grain two seventy, yeah, you should be able to now with some of your modern long bullets, fast twist, high BCs, et cetera, et cetera do the same thing at 600 yards. For putting your bullet on target, I agree with one fly in the ointment. Time. You're taking a around, what do you think, half second? to get 600 yards yeah. with most of the bullets mm-hmm. you're talking about? And as you know, when your brain says fire, 
and then you've got your lock time and you're in the barrel time and all the rest. But the time that bullet leaves, it wasn't exactly when you said fire. So there's a little bit of time there. But the biggest amount of time is the bullet's flight. It's flying through the air with the greatest of ease and where it lands, the deer decided to take a sneeze. And he moved his head or he stepped forward or he changed his position sufficiently. Now, this could obviously happen at 100 yards, but by the time a bullet goes 100 yards, if that deer's moving, you're going to still get him in a vital zone. That's one. my one argument, strong argument, against taking those longer shots is that time of flight of the bullet. And I'm with you there, but I do have some conciliatory factors that I can just throw out there. But mm -hmm. I do like to tell listeners and viewers that if you want to shoot long, at game animals, whether long for you is 400 yards or 600 yards or for the extremists past that, you really need to walk that walk. You need to live, mm. eat, breathe, dream long range <laughs> shooting. Yep. You can't be a part timer. You can't have somebody else set your package up for you and have you out for a weekend shooting course and then go and start popping away at animals at a thousand yards because you're going to wound a lot of animals and you're going to miss a lot of animals and you're going to have a lot of frustration and heartache for you. And let's call it what it is, unethical results downrange, right? Mm -hmm. So on a pure technical stance, let's talk about this time of flight thing. I mean, the guy's shooting a thousand yards, 1200 yards, or even up against it much more. Yeah. You have to read your situation. I would never encourage somebody to shoot at a game animal, even at 500 yards in a little window in a thick pine forest because yeah. you're probably not going to get a follow-up shot and you may not uh, even be able to see the reaction. If your gun recoils hard, yep. you're not able to spot your own impact or have a good spotter, you may not know what happened. And you may not want to cross that canyon to go 500 yards to check. But it's your duty to do so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You take that shot. Yeah, so if if the animal's in the wide open and is in a calm state right i would far rather have one of my kids take a long shot at a totally calm animal mm -hmm. considering calm wind and right. ideal conditions than a panicked shot at something bounding away at 300 yards yeah how right? many how many guys who would decry shooting at anything at 400 yards or farther take a shot risky yes. shot at closer mm -hmm. ranges yeah good point yeah and i mean so you can debate the ethical side six ways till sunday and that would be a fun conversation to have sometime each just pick a side and go pick for a side it and go yeah but for now there is one other technical factor that closes the gap let's say you're a 30 odd six shooter and you traditionally shoot 180 grain bullet exiting the muzzle at about 2700 feet per second and your bullet of choice is one of the classic tried and true flat base lead tip bullets whether it's a hornady interlocked or remington core locked or winchester powerpoint whatever the case may yep. be you're losing a lot of speed in a hurry mm -hmm. okay so it takes you a certain it will even to a let's call it that quarter mile capability 440 yards i know a lot of deer personally i've i've visited them with on with them on on the walls you know their family oh yeah that have been shot at 400 to 450 yards with a 30 out six and just such a bullet it worked mm -hmm. okay but it's not optimal if you're to take something like oh let's take something speedy one of the modern demons 28 nozzler mm -hmm. and run a fairly high bc 160 grain type bullet out of it going well into the 3000s 31 32 100 yeah, maybe more right it's got the bc to hold on to that velocity and it's starting faster that really closes the gap on your time of flight mm -hmm. when you go from 440 yards to 600 yards so there is that it's a small deal but that's the sort of thing that you and I enjoy sweating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we pretty much covered the ethics of this. Everyone, I always encourage everyone to make up your own mind on this. And as Joseph said, you have got to know that you can drop that bullet on that target the first time. Every yeah. Time. It's no walking it in stuff here. <laughs> it's not a weekend pursuit. It's no. a, a lifestyle and long have, range shooting and especially when it transfers to hunting if you want to do that you need to be good at it before you attempt it yep and you need to know how to call the wind and that's always the biggest challenge yes but again your high bc bullets make that easier mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people just don't get it they go what well, big deal about this bc bullet stuff all you ever talk about are bcs what's so important about it and it does seem like it's a little bit frivolous at first but when you do your studying and you understand what's going on here it's all about 
hanging on to what that cartridge produces at the muzzle. You're going to increase your downrange energy because your bullet has not shed that energy fighting yeah. the wind to get there. And that's why it drops less and deflects less in the wind. Everything's faster. The bullet gets there faster and more efficiently. So it's going to have better terminal performance when it gets there too, because you've retained more energy. Yep. So kills better. Yeah. Yep. Everything is grand about it, you know, except for the shooter himself. And it's like uh, your earlier statement about you can't just go buy the package and expect to be a long range shooter, which is human nature, right? And it's popular these days because modern man has less time than money. Yep. And it's easier to spend a, a just scandalous amount of dollars and get this beautiful setup and to consider yourself well equipped and well prepared than it is to put in what a friend in New Zealand calls the hard yards and do, and work it all up yourself. Right. But you're sure not going to learn it. Right. You know, and you can buy technology, but you can't buy woodsmanship. Yeah. And it's a lot easier for most people these days to buy the technology because if you're living in a typical suburban environment or in a city, you can't get out, step out your door and go hunting for a few hours and see what the deer were doing and see what That's kind of right. tracks you can find. Yep. So it's difficult to learn that stuff. But by golly, you can get a high-tech rifle with a high-tech cartridge and a high-tech scope <laughs> and a high-tech bullet and shoot a long range and make up for what you can't do in the woods. Now, I'm not condemning anybody who's in that situation. I get it. And even folks like Joseph and I, who were pretty rural when we grew up and prowled around the woods and rolled around in the mud and the blood and we still are a little susceptible to that extra reach. I think it's just human nature. You know, you want to reach out and touch someone, watch this. Who it's, hasn't been doing that for the last 2,000 years? Yeah. I mean, would we have gone to bows and arrows if they hadn't been better than spears? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Got to go to the bow. And since we're stricken with bows, why not get something with wheels and cams on it and shoot a little faster and flatter? Sure. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's just human nature. So, okay, we've got the high tech. We've got the new cartridges. The advantage across the board then is that they're all set up with fast twist barrels to handle longer, more efficient bullets so you can shoot more precisely. So really, even though they're not inherently more accurate than the older cartridges, because of that efficiency in the bullet, your actual on-target accuracy does improve because if you judge yes. the wind a little bit wrong, you're still going to be in there. There's a lot more forgiveness. I heard it put once by a... a actually a national champion long range shooter at camp perry where he said we're talking about bullets for a thousand yards and he he referred to a common one in use and he said when i use this other one it gets me two more rings mm -hmm. and it took me a minute to connect to what he meant these these thousand yard targets are pretty big and each ring is about two and a half inches if i remember right on that particular discipline he meant if he called the wind wrong that thing is is basically um, two rings more forgiving, less wind drift. So his mistake is less exacerbated yeah. and it's not going to drop his score as much. And he felt like that's important when you're trying for world championship. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's another one of, of the reasons the six, five Creedmoor has been more successful at the long range game than the 308 Winchester. Oh yeah. A lot of older guys that, Oh gosh, the 308, that's God. You can't step on its toes yet. When you look at the, the numbers and who's winning the matches, the Creedmoor is beating it because of that less wind deflection. And it's a, a milder cartridge to shoot, a little yeah. less recoil. Now, inside 300 yards, I'll take the 308 every time for use on game because mm -hmm. it, it's a little harder. It's got a little bit more frontal diameter, a little bit more bullet mass. And I'm a guy that likes to hit stuff with a sledgehammer rather than slicing with a scalpel. Just my way, you know? Uh, and if I can swing my sledgehammer as accurately as I can a scalpel, why not swing the sledgehammer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's too many people out there going to think of 308 Widget was a sledgehammer. But well, no, <laughs> I'm, but you get into some of these bigger cartridges like the 300 PRC we'll talk about briefly. Uh -huh. That's a sledgehammer. Well, since you mentioned it, let's go with it. Look, I'm looking at that 300 PRC and I'm saying, that doesn't look like much more than a 300 wind mag. What's the big deal? Okay. It's all about optimal balance. If you look at um, that cartridge, it's got a lot of bullet protruding from the mouth of the case. That's called head height. And it means that the base of that bullet isn't taking up propellant capacity down inside that cartridge case. To put that same bullet in a 300 Winchester Magnum, well, you can't do it because to seat it far enough to fit down into your magazine, 
Now the case of the mouth is hanging over the curve of the bullet. Plus, the base of that bullet's extending way down in and taking up powder capacity. So you get a, a capability to shoot a longer, higher BC bullet with a 300 PRC. Now, yeah, you can create a 300 Winchester Magnum custom rifle with a long magazine and achieve this same thing, right? Yeah. But this one is engineered from the ground up to do that. Doesn't have a belt for those who care. I don't. I've had great performance out of a lot of belted cartridges. Yeah, I'm with you. But I do know the uh, the theory, the ballistic theory, the design theory, the engineering concept behind the belted, the non-belted case, and it's sound. But uh, uh, another nice thing about the 300 PRC is it gives you everything you need with a heavy bullet. This particular one's a 212 grain ELDX, I believe. Mm -hmm. Could be a 225 grain ELD match. It gives you enough propellant to drive that really, really effectively without being hugely overbore. You can put that bullet, actually, you can't put this bullet into a custom 300 Remington Ultra Magnum because the Ultra Mag already is right. a very long cartridge. You can't really yeah, build a, a magnum length. Yeah, cartridge. you'd have to single load them because it's already a magnum length cartridge. So this achieves better performance at extreme range than a 300 Ultra Mag does, even though it's shooting a lot less powder, purely because that bullet, that, that's where the magic happens. It's got so good aerodynamics, it doesn't lose speed. Mm -hmm. The 300 Magnum, uh, Ultra Mag may start a little faster, but that velocity drops off. The 300 PRC's long, heavy bullets are going to pass it, have less wind deflection, less bullet drop, and more retained energy faster than you'd think yeah well so essentially this is a 300 win mag without the belt it comes within what maybe gives you 50 feet per second more velocity so it's really not a velocity race that they were right entering. that's it's not all the, about the bullet yeah it's about the bullet and maximizing its performance one other thing i think worth mentioning on the 300 prc is the dimensions in the throat yeah in the chamber stuff they've it's essentially it's a match grade chamber there's a very tight fit between the bullet and the throat before it ramps up into the into the lands and uh, gets engraved. Whereas with the Winchester, you've got a little more wobble room in there. Yeah. Chamber geometry is a big deal these days. I think Hornady kind of kicked off that trend with the 6.5 Creedmoor. And that's mm -hmm. one reason that cartridge is universally accurate in almost all factory rifles because they built it with match spec yep. chambers. And they really got the geometry of the throat, the rifling lead, all those relationships just right. And also set it up. This is a PRC, not a Creedmoor, but it has similar design up here. Set it up to have a, a lot of bullet protruding, plenty of head height, so you can shoot those high BC bullets without the accompanying downsides of having it protruding into your propellant capacity or not fitting in your magazine, whatever the case may be. There's another feature shared by many of the modern cartridges browning's new 6.8 western i believe is another one mm -hmm. and that's why you'll see engineers test engineers that shoot you know new production grade rifles in test tunnels day after day week after week for companies like browning and so forth so these engineers have told me that this new crop of cartridges the 6.5 creedmoor the 6.5 prc 6.8 western the 300 prc tend to shoot more accurately in a broad spectrum of production grade rifles than other cartridges do. And I believe that's a chamber advantage where cartridges like the 30 out six, the 300 one mag, the 270, they're built with a, what I call a sloppy chamber yeah. so that they'll fit any factory ammo out there. Yep. Well, all this new factory ammo that's being built for these high performance cartridges is being held to a tighter, to, you know, tighter degree of quality. Yeah. And so you don't have to make a sloppy chamber in case somebody makes an out-of-spec cartridge. Cha cartridge. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and I, that's been my conclusion, too. You know, when I look at these, I, you start to look at the cartridges themselves and you see there's something familiar about this. And it's those longer bullets, the first thing. Yep. They stick out way much farther than in traditional cartridges. And for the reasons that you explained, okay. The shoulders are usually 30 degrees, sometimes mm -hmm. 35, but it seems like they're all starting to land on 30 degrees for one reason or another. Why do you think they're going to 30 degree shoulders? Is it the right balance? I think it's a balance issue. I think it has a, a lot of facets. Burn, 
uh, efficiency, the, the combustion efficiency of the propellant inside that cartridge chamber seems to benefit, I believe, from a little bit sharper shoulder. So when, when the primer pops and it injects this blast of flame in through that column of gunpowder granules, those granules want to puff like a, you know, a snowball shot through with a, a bullet or something. Anyway, you know what I'm, I'm saying? Yeah, All that, going they want to puff and, and they want to swirl. And a lot of the unburned ones want to follow that bullet down the barrel, which is, you know, it works. They're still burning as they travel down the barrel. But I think those shoulders tend to help them stay in a matrix inside that body and combust in the most efficient place, which is the chamber um, itself. Yeah. Right. I think that's part of it. I think it also enables you to get a little bit more gunpowder in mm -hmm. by steeping up that shoulder. And yet if you don't go overboard, it does not adversely affect feeding, right. which is a, is one of those few things that we experience. The few downsides we see with a lot of the, the short magnum modern cartridges. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's puzzled me about the, the feeding issue. I get the ramping up and you've got a nice gentle shoulder. It'll slide right up slick as not, if I can say that. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's but, accurate. <laughs> but the, cra the crazy thing with me is I have never had a problem with 40 degree shoulders on the Ackleys. And I think that's a length thing. So this is a 280 Ackley right here. Mm -hmm. If you compare that, we've got a couple of short magnums here. It's more slender, mm -hmm. right? That's long. And yet it's longer. So when it tips up out of that magazine, it doesn't have to jump quite as aggressively. You imagine a ski jumper coming off of a jump that just went like a skateboard yeah. ramp, right? right? At the skateboard park, he'd take a big bite out of the rail of that skateboard thing because he's going too fast, mm -hmm. right? I think having a gentler slope up makes it much easier for a cartridge to feed. And the diameter plays a part there too. And yet I've got a 22-250 AI, mm -hmm. short, 40-degree shoulder, and I don't have any feeding issues with it. It's a custom rifle, right? Oh, yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> so we got to pull in <laughs> some professional expertise tuning that rifle. Yeah, and that's probably what did it, but it is slick and smooth. But at any rate, we're talking about efficiency in the powder burn, efficiency in the chambers, in feeding. The whole program just seems to be, have been thought out really, really well. Yeah. As much as we kind of hate to admit it, you know, the, the guys will call me an old fuddy because I still like the 270 Winchester and all the old guys, the old classics. I always tell them, hey, we almost wiped out the buffalo with black powder. So I think we're probably all right with the 270. <laughs> yeah, I grew up with a 270. And as I mentioned in the beginning, one of my all time favorite cartridges is a 300 H&H. &H. Yeah. It's not greatly efficient, but it feeds like smooth as silk and it shoots more accurately than it has any right to considering its chamber design. Yeah. I just love it. But if I'm going somewhere on a, a hunt for something very exclusive, whether it's to a place that has big Alpine country mule deer, but only a few of them and you got to work real hard for an opportunity, mm -hmm. or if you're lucky enough to go on a sheep hunt somewhere, doll sheep to Alaska or, or what have you, Usually you want to stack the deck in your favor in every way you can. And having a very capable cartridge is one of the best ways to do that. I do think that laser range finders and modern dial-up scopes and even rifles configured to help humans get, you know, achieve the best possible accuracy out of that rifle with stock geometries and so forth has played a big part as well in achieving this and really pushing the projectile trend. Because if you think about it, in the end, there's one connection between you and your game. It's not your rifle, your scope, your cartridge, not even your boots. It's that projectile. Yeah, the bullet is everything. Everything else is just a support medium. Yeah. It's the support staff in the background, the launching pad. That's right. It's the bullet that's doing all the work. So, so what about this big variety of cartridges? I mean, I know you, you told me you made a pretty spectacular shot on a whitetail with the 6.8 Western, right? So you've had some experience with it. They, they span all the way from the 6.5 Creedmoor, even the 6 mm Creedmoor, Six, yeah, right? Same, right. Right up through the 300 PRC. When you've got cartridges coming out that are being billed as more capable than anything else. And they're, you know, you'll see charts listing all their characteristics that are pretty convincing but which ones do you want to pick for hunting and why and 
which ones are are best for the game you want to take. Mm-hmm. Are you asking me or are you setting yourself up? <coughs> well, both. <laughs> I think I'm I know you me. like the 6.8 Western because you made a spectacular shot with it. Okay. So let's start with that one. Okay. Let's just talk about it briefly. What well, it's the modern 270. It's the short action 270. It's yeah. the 270 WSM optimized for the very things we've been talking about, the longer bullets and the efficiency. Other than that, yeah. What's wrong with the 270 WSM? Well, it was designed back in the era where laser rangefinders were just coming on. Yeah. And people hadn't gotten wind meters to figure out the wind stuff. And all that long range stuff wasn't quite happening yet. Speed was still king. Speed was the king. So all they did was say, let's take the 270 Winchester and bring it into the 21st century before the 21st century was quite properly identified yet <laughs> yes so they were the really the latter days of the 20th century so they got the speed and they got the efficiency from a short action but they weren't able to stabilize the long sleek bullets that were just coming on yep they didn't this give it, does it they didn't give it enough head height they yep. didn't give it a fast enough rifling yep. twist rate so much as i love the grand old 270 winchester candidly i have to confess that's a better cartridge they're shooting 175 grain bullets out of a 270 bore and shooting them a long way with excellent effect. Yep. To me, it's really good for game up to including elk with oh. a good bullet. Oh, yeah. Certainly capable for moose. It's not what I'd pick for moose. I wouldn't hesitate for a second on a moose. And like I say, I, I think it's capable, but personally, I'd rather be packing that. You would, huh? 300 PRC, yeah. Bigger bullet, hits a little bit harder, bucks the wind just as well or even better. So uh, at present, the best of the 270 bullets that they're shooting have a BC of around 0. 0.620 yep. on the G1 BC scale. BCs are a topic for another time, but there are several different scales. Let's just stick to the G1 because it's the most common. Mm -hmm. That bullet right there has that's a... The, that's 300 PRC. Or 300 PRC. And do you remember if that's the 212 or the 225? I don't. Let's stick to hunting bullets. If that's the 212 grain ELDX, it's almost at 700. You go to the match bullets, you're pushing close to eight in the wow. 770s. Yeah. And that's a, a big difference. So that's if I can. Significant BC yeah. If I can shoot a, a cartridge comfortably, I'm pretty comfortable with recoil, right? Mm -hmm. That carries half again as much bullet weight, bucks the wind better. Why wouldn't I on mm. moose? Mm -hmm. I think that's a grand deer cartridge myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about comfort. If you can shoot it comfortably and, and the recoil doesn't bother and you, you have a rifle that you really love because that great big cartridge, whatever it is, always hits what you shoot at and kills it fast. There's nothing to complain about. Yeah. Now, if you're recoil sensitive or if you have a, a physical deal, like I, I tore that uh, cartilage in that uh, clavicle one time. Probably and come shooting too big of a cartridge. I put 88 rounds through a 458 lot in one sitting. That would do it. <laughs> that, it did it. <laughs> yeah. And the chiropractor told me not to do that anymore. Oh, really? And she can find me to 6.5 cartridges for six months. There you go. And see? smaller. And so that year I hunted everything I hunted with a 6.5 by 284. Oh, that's a nice little cartridge. It too. is. Going to go away though, I'm afraid unfortunately i think the 300 PRC. or the 6.5 prc yeah. is displacing it pretty rapidly yeah. yep that prc cartridge you just <laughs> held up there to me that is going to be the 6.5 of the 21st century almost undoubtedly yeah. yep it gives you nearly 300 feet per second over the 6.5 creedmoor which is a significant jump shoots yeah. a heavier bullet yeah. better yep. it's as well mannered so it's as easy to achieve um excellent accuracy with whether yeah. you're hand loading or shooting factory ammo it's an extremely good cartridge i have seen some unfortunate things on elk with that cartridge but mm -hmm. in every case it was due to the bullet being too soft failing to penetrate adequately yeah on the shot that was taken yeah. Yeah, anytime i hear someone say this cartridge <laughs> failed on elk moose deer whatever I go, the cartridge failed the bullet failed <laughs> yeah yeah the bullet failed That's or right. the shooter failed so what about that one that one's a 28 nozzler, and we brought it in here because it's one of the trendiest cartridges on the modern Western hunting scene. Mm -hmm. What do you think of it? I know what I think of it. I think I have 
I don't think enough of it to even have played around with it. When I first saw it, I just look at the numbers. I go, okay, yeah, we've just ramped up to the top end for a seven. Maybe the rum will beat it a little bit, depending on who's loading what. But I don't see where a, a huge enough advantage over the old seven rem mag, and here's the FUD coming out in me again, that I think it's worth making a change. Uh, but then I'm not the guy who's trying to shoot something past 400 yards. It's very sure. seldom that I shoot that far. Because I'm still old-fashioned enough that I like to challenge myself to the stock. But getting back to what you were saying about you spent all this money and all this time to go on this expensive hunt in Alaska or anywhere yeah. else. And these days, it's not like, well, if I don't get one, I'll come back next year. That might be the only tag you get for five, six years or your lifetime. Yeah. So Imagine a once-in-a-lifetime ma- desert sheep permit in yeah. Utah or Arizona or Nevada. You're going to absolutely take the best tool for the task. Yeah. And I think that's what's driving a lot of this stuff. It's not just the fact that guys are lazy or they just want to use technology instead of learn mm-hmm. to be a hunter and all the arguments you can make either way. That's just a practical decision. If, if I've got to spend this much money and I only get so many opportunities to hunt, I want to be able to make sure that I'm yeah. going to get the job done. And time. Modern man does not have much time. How can that be? We've got all these labor-saving devices and tools around the house. It's Those don't give us more time off. They just enable us to do more and take on more stress all at once. <laughs> well, I've been there. Yeah. So the 28 Nosler, can I throw out my two cents oh, here? absolutely. I think it's the tip of the extreme performance spear. If you like muscle cars and tuning extremely uh, capable equipment, this is a very good cartridge. It doesn't have the head height that allows you to run those real long bullets seated well out of the case if you're hand loading, unless you have a custom rifle built with the long magazine. As it sits right there, it's technically a 30 out six length cartridge. So with the long magazine, you can run the long bullets in it. It holds a lot of powder. It is overboard. It burns barrels fast. But if you get a good load tuned in it, it is extremely capable at extreme distance. It and the 300 PRC are my two top cartridges. If you are that guy that's going to live the lifestyle, dream the dreams, walk the walk, and hunt past those, shoot past those distances most of us are not comfortable with, those are my two top choices. And I'm talking, dare I say, past a thousand yards. For the guys, that want to shoot extreme range with the most potential capability they can achieve. Those two cartridges, in my opinion, are that tip of the high performance spear, the 300 PRC and the 28 nozzler. But if you are a hand loader and you really tune your rival, you can achieve incredibly good performance. This is for the guys, and I'm not one of them, I don't endorse this, but the want to shoot past a thousand yards with ethical lethality. Both of those cartridges will shoot a projectile that will carry ethical terminal capability that far. And that's important. Whether or not you can put a bullet in your vitals, in the, you know, the deer or elk's vitals at that distance is a different matter. That's on the human. But first, you better be shooting. If you're going to try that, you better be shooting a bullet that is ethically lethal on arrival. And some of these others are not quite there. Yeah, I can buy that. I just never consider my cartridges based on what they're going to do at a thousand yards. I'm sorry, but but some people do, and I think that's where those two particularly actually have a legitimate claim to exist. What what I think is really crazy are the guys who shoot a six five Creedmoor and they think you're going to shoot game at a thousand Mm -hmm. yards with it. Oh my goodness! And that's that's a I call that a the great six five deception. Because that cartridge misleads shooters. You can hit a vital size target almost laughably easy at a thousand yards with a 6.5 Creedmoor, but it's hitting like a dang 22 out there. Is it hitting or touching? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of ringing your target, it tinks a little. Anyway, I've seen that. Yeah. I've seen the results. It's not pretty. Yeah, the 6.5 is. To my mind, I mean, this is one man's opinion, right? But it is not a thousand yard killer. I, you know, and I don't think any of, I realize that the energy is there, the bullet construction is there, and the precision in the cartridge and rifle itself are there. But I get back to the human element. Yeah. How many times can a really skilled shooter drop it on target the first shot of the day? And that's what you get when you're hunting. Yeah. 
and I get it. They're, the guys who really work and train at this can get awfully darn good. But guaranteeing first round hit on a vital zone at that range. With unknown under, wind vectors. Un, unknown wind and yeah. field conditions and valleys in between and all the other factors. You, even if you do a lot of field shooting and practice and competitions and it just... Yeah. For me, it's just a it's beyond the pale for most of us. Yeah. I competed fairly seriously in an F class shooting for a while. The ten ring, thousand yard ten ring, is ten inches, mm -hmm. and you get two siders before you start your relay. Right, you're laying down prone, rear rest, great big bipod up front, twenty two pound rifle. <laughs> right, this I mean, is a hunting setup here. Folks. Everything is right. And the number of shooters who fire their two siders and get them in that 10 ring, let's call it a deer vital size. Yeah. With the first two siders in unknown wind, new range, whatever, at this new competition, right? These are as controlled of conditions as you can get. There's wind flags all the way oh, down the range. My. Heavy rifle, plenty of time to slow your heart rate down and breathe and get calm. Watch the flags, time your shot. You get two siders. Almost never do both of those go into the 10 ring. Wow. They're siders for a reason. You shoot them, then you fix your scope, and you're like, okay, let's start the match. So right? You can't that, do that in the field. Do that on an elk, eh? Right. Elk's yeah. easier. That's an 18-inch file. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I was forgetting that. But let's go to a pronghorn. <laughs> no doubt. So the yeah. only one we haven't talked about here yet. Yeah, I was wondering why you dried that. Folks, if you're listening with the podcast here and not watching this on uh, YouTube, my friend Joseph is holding up an unusual cartridge in this little collection we have. This does not have the long, sleek bullet on top of it. It does not have a 30-degree sloped shoulder. It's not fat. It doesn't look like it has all that much powder capacity, and yet he loves it, and unlikely as it might seem, so do I. <laughs> this is the grand 280 Ackley Improved. Bingo. And it was designed, what, 60 years ago? Who? Oh, who knows 50 when years Ack ago. P.O. Ackley was doing this stuff in the 50s and 60s. Yes. This is a cartridge way ahead of its time. It's got a steep shoulder. And in my rifles, this is a factory cartridge we're holding. So it's got the standard bullet not protruding way out. But in my rifles, I do see long-range bullets out further. So I get the performance of those. This is an extremely well-balanced, inherently accurate cartridge that gives what I think is the best balanced performance for across the spectrum use in the West of all the cartridges I regularly use. It's a 7mm, right? Mm -hmm. 280 Ackley improved. 28, same thing as a 7mm. So you've got untold numbers of projectiles you can hand load for it. In modern times, this, this thing has really taken off in the last 10 years or so. It was legitimized from a wildcat and, you know, somebody's invention cartridge uh, around 2008, if I'm not mistaken, by Nosler. They're around 12 or 13 factory loads you can get now with a bunch of different great bullets. You can get rifles from Browning, Savage, Ruger, a bunch of the big names and all of your semi-custom names. And it plays neck and neck with all of these other modern cartridges. I just love that fact that over a half century ago, somebody designed a cartridge that was that capable and would expand with the future projectiles that comfortably. And uh, the fascinating thing about it is this is glorified 30 out six neck down. And the 30 out six is a glorified 757 lengthened. <laughs> and we go all the way back to the 1880s to get the eight by 57 Mauser that started it all. Same head size. Same rim size. You know, it's your basic cartridge that's that old and it's still able to tweak the design mm -hmm. just enough to make the 280 AI perform as well as it does. And when you look at a cartridge like that and think, well, how can it be that much different? But it's these little factors that all tie together. And that's why new cartridges keep popping up. As much as we like to complain about another redundant cartridge, my gosh, how many of them do we need? We've got 13 7 millimeters on the market right now. We've got 15 30s on the market right now. How many 6.5s are born every other week? And it's like, when are they ever going to stop? Folks, they're never going to stop. Because and it's a beautiful thing because it keeps you and I in business <laughs> and gives all of you out there something new to save for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's just the human nature. We always try for more perfection, something sure. new, something better, the better mousetrap, even if it's a subtle increase. 
bottom line on this, folks, before we ring off here, is you do not need these new cartridges. If you're an old FUD like me and you've been taking your game out to 400 yards or maybe even 500 all this time, good Lord, Jack O'Connor back in the 30s and 40s was taking game quite nicely at 500 yards just by guessing the distance and holding over and dropping its 270, 130 green bullets in there. You know, it can be done, but this stuff is allowing for more precision. And when you tie it in with the scopes we have these days, and especially the, the laser range finders and the wind meters for w reading the wind and everything, if you hold your shots inside of 600 yards, you ought to be able to drop them in there as effectively as you did at, say, 400 yards, or like you said, 440, the 440 dash. <laughs> That's right. This is up to it quite nicely right there. So the important thing is, regardless which cartridge you pick, it's make yourself the best rifleman you can be. Yeah. It's always on the end user. It's not yep. what you have. It's how well you use it. Yep. So pick something that you can work with a lot, shoot a lot, train a lot, and then hunt within your limitations. Yeah. I'm old school enough that I like practicing from improvised field positions. Absolutely. Not using the fanciest, latest, greatest bipods and all the whiz-bang gadgets. Yep. My creed has always been to be the best hunter I possibly can be so I can get close and kill cleanly every time and yet also to be the best rifleman i can possibly be so that when things go awry whether it's with a hunt of my own or friends that i'm along on or i just have to make a long shot i can do so ethically and lethally and when i'm doing that these cartridges help yeah they sure do Hey, Joseph, I want to thank you for filling us in on what the old FUD doesn't know <laughs> about these new cartridges. My was... pleasure, but I, I wouldn't say I taught you much. <laughs> well, you know, it is interesting as you get a little uh, long in the tooth and have experienced all this stuff, how you start to decide that, yeah, that's good enough. Sure. <laughs> I've been working with it for so many years. Why should I give up on it now? But I can certainly see where the new cartridges do have a leg up on the older competition. So folks, I want to thank you all for joining us here on Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. And I want to thank our guest, Joseph von Benedict. And he has a podcast channel that's really, really fun. What's the name of it? The Backcountry Hunting Podcast. Audio only at this point. I don't do any video yet. I should be doing that. But you can find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever podcasts are published. Great. And of course, you can find us on Ron Spomer Outdoors YouTube channel too, where we cover more ballistics and numbers and lots of fun stuff. Uh, RonSpomerOutdoors.com is our website. And on there, you can find our written materials on this with lots of figures and numbers and drop charts and such. Uh, and you can also find RSOTV.com at the website. That's a subscription service where we cover more in-depth rifle reviews, some hunting programs, and a lot of things that we can't necessarily show on social media. We do want to thank our patrons for supporting all of this. You guys are definitely keeping us in the limelight, if this is any kind of a limelight. <laughs> but at least we're still on the air. So this is Ron Spomer once again, thanking you all for listening and thanking our guest, Joseph Von Benedict, for showing up today. We're going to try to get this gentleman on again in the future because as you've seen or heard, he really knows his stuff. In the meantime, hunt honest and shoot straight. <music>